I've obviously been a, a proponent of renewables, a fan of uh, both wind and solar. I've looked at what's happened in specifically in Texas, because Texas is usually a case study for Bitcoin miners. Um, but if everything you're saying is correct about nuclear, what what argument really is there for wind and solar? Um, what part can they actually play? And is it just a total waste of time? And should everything be moved to nuclear? So I would say we are um, more opposed to wind than we are to solar for the following reason. Um, solar is very seductive because it, it, we get irradiated with many orders of magnitude more energy than we could ever possibly use on an ongoing basis. Um, fractions of a percent. You know, I think it's something like 1% of the solar energy is captured in the form of photosynthesis and a very small fraction of that is used to feed us. Like there's just so much energy basically for free hitting the earth every day that it's a problem that's always worth investigating, always worth studying, always worth developing. Our position on solar is the U.S. needs to reclaim, or the West, Europe and, and the U.S. need to reclaim um, their manufacturing ability in the space because right now it's basically outsourced to China, which is using dirty coal and, and slave labor to, uh, to produce the panels that we all proudly put on our homes. Um, I own a fair bit of solar technology, um, mostly as a sort of backup. Um, and, and so solar, you know, if we could crack the intermittency problem, which again, Bitcoin mining could potentially help, um, it would, uh, it, it could play a significant role in our energy future, and we would be certainly for its continued development. Um, wind, on the other hand, um, is really just an atrocity. Um, you know, giant amounts of, of, of concrete, of, of epoxy, of, of, of um, you know, high-end magnets in the, in the motors, um, a lot of damage to the wildlife, a lot of damage, especially offshore, you know, um, for people that are supposed to be pro-planet, um, to be for wind and against nuclear is just absurd on its face. And that's because of a lot of the, you know, we know a lot of birds are killed by uh, flying into the blades yeah. or flying into the, the units. And whales and, you know, marine life and the construction of these things, like, and they're an eyesore, like, let's be honest. Um, I drive through um, the rural parts of the state that I live in here in the U.S. and they dot the landscape and they never seem to be moving. Um, you know, they seem to have an awful lot of downtime. It's the same issue, intermittency, same issue with extended energy payback periods. Most of, um, most of the, these projects are just tax harvesting, tax loss harvesting for, um, for rich people. I mean, these, these credits get bundled into, uh, into financial vehicles that allow wealthy people to avoid paying taxes. And so that there's a whole other scandal embedded there. So I was just having a look at um, uh, energy on the grid right now in the UK. And the um, amount of wind is at 56%. So that's yes. like obviously a huge part of our grid now. So sort of convincing people that that's not been a good investment, it's going to be really hard, surely. Well, but let me, let me correct you though. Not that long ago, it was next to nothing. And it's that intermittency, that instability that it brings into the grid. Because when it's not 56%, but it's 4%, mm -hmm. that other 52% has to come from somewhere. And it's usually a natural gas peaker plant that is filling the void. And wow. so um, you are correct that today in Germany and in the UK, it's warm and it's windy. Great. Um, the power grid is expected to be on all the time. And it's the, the wildness of the, like wind is even less predictable than solar because you know solar is not going to happen at night and you can predict the weather seven or eight days out. Um, but wind is a whole different matter. And if you look at that um, percent of the grid that is um, coming from wind over time, you will see a very chaotic line. And the operators of that grid, uh, you know, an electricity grid is a very fine balancing act between supply and demand. And, um, and so when people turn on the switch, they expect the light to come on. And, and so um, the wind volatility is the issue. Um, not so much um, the amount that it can produce at any particular time. But presumably that wind has taken over from even if it's intermittent, in that intermittent period, it's taken over from coal or gas, I would imagine. Um, so is that, a, even if it's intermittent, is that better for the time that it's up and running? Well, again, it depends on how you calculate it. So the cost of being ready for the intermittency is never included yeah. in the cost and the payback period of, of wind, right? Um, and what is the point if you can't like just use it? And so this is where storage is such a big deal, right? Um, mm. Like is it, if you could, if you could run full throttle and store for when you don't have this intermittency, um, that would be great, except storage is not ready for it yet, uh, contrary to what people say. And so 
Um, when it's windy, wind can produce a lot of power. Nuclear power produces the same amount of power all the time. Yeah. It's very predictable. So what about batteries? Again, this is another technology that people talk about, but it seems to be the one part of uh, uh, society where we don't seem to have technically advanced uh, with the pace of other kind of technologies. For some reason, uh, battery storage seems to just be something that, I don't know, it seems like to me batteries are pretty much the same technology we've had for the last 20, 30 years. Has anything been done in that area? So battery development is extraordinarily challenging and very, very incremental percents of improvement a year um, at best. And batteries for you know, hybrid electric vehicles make a lot more sense than batteries for full electric vehicles, we could talk about that, and make almost no sense for grid storage. Um, I'm not sure if you saw that uh, Joe Rogan had a guest that went viral this week uh, talking yes, about I did. Um, child labor and, and what they call artisanal mines uh, in the Congo. It's a scandal of, of epic proportions. Mm. Um, the issue with batteries is we do not have enough materials uh, in places we're willing to mine to satisfy the projections for electric vehicles, let alone electric vehicles plus storage. And the amount of batteries you would need to store an hour's worth of the UK's grid is unfathomable. Uh, the very same people who are for battery storage are opposed to the permitting of all these new mines that will be needed um, and all the diesel fuel that will go into the trucks that will do the mining uh, to get this job done. Our view on batteries is since batteries are a constraint, we should prioritize to that constraint. Um, if you have one full battery electric vehicle today, Peter, um, there's probably an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack in there. And so for that 80 kilowatt hour battery pack, we will abate your fossil fuel use of one person. If you split that battery pack in four and produce four plug-in hybrid electric vehicles where the vast majority of people can abate 90% of their fossil fuel use, um, four times 90 is 360, which means plug-in hybrids are 3.6 times better for displacing fossil fuels um, than full battery electrics. But the governments around the world are basically prioritizing full BEVs over plug-in hybrids. That's an example of a stupid policy that we could change today that we would be all for. Um, plug-in hybrids are great. They solve a lot of the problem. They don't come with range anxiety. Um, and for the first 40 or 50 miles that you would drive on a 20 kilowatt hour battery um, are carbon free, essentially. Well, I mean, depending on where you get your electricity, of course, but certainly fossil fuel free. And then um, the engine would kick in once the battery is depleted and you could charge it again um, overnight. And so um, the, the equation we should be optimizing for batteries is gallons of fossil fuel abated per kilowatt hour. Um, the, the, the one vehicle that has done the most to abate fossil fuel use in the world is of course the, the Toyota Prius, which has a much smaller battery pack than that. Um, and you get 40 to 50 miles per gallon versus a fleet average when they were rolled out of, uh, in the low 20s. Uh, and so, you know, those are the types of things that we should be prioritizing. But storage for the grid is incredibly hard. You know, our, our good friend, Dr. Chris Kiefer, who, who runs uh, the Decouple podcast, had a brilliant guy, um, Mark Nelson, uh, who is a nuclear power expert. They did a show called Masterclass on Storage, and I would encourage everybody to listen to it. It was really brilliantly done. Um, battery packs for storage is probably the dumbest of the suite of very bad ideas being put forth today, and that's being kind. So would you say the electric car market itself is a bit of a scam in the way it's being sold to us? Uh, again, um, I, we are for the proliferation of technologies that could abate the amount of gasoline that we use to power our vehicles. So to the extent that um, the explosion in the development and in the interest of electric vehicles has caused the automakers to um, radically reconsider how the car of the future will be made, that's an unabashedly positive thing. Um, we would be for um, plug-in hybrids and hybrids um, as a pathway to when battery technology gets to the point where we could completely abate the need for, fossil, for gasoline. Um, the technology and the battery materials aren't quite there yet, as you've highlighted. And so we're big believers in that you should, um, you know, uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. We have technologies that can rapidly increase um, the, the, the fuel efficiency of the modern vehicle with, with minimal sacrifice to standard of living, go back to the same topic, um, and we should deploy them uh, in a smart way. So I, I, I wouldn't say that it's a scam. I think there are an awful lot of um, fishy startups and the whole SPAC boom and all that stuff that turned out to be scams. But the concept of 
partnering um, smaller and smaller internal combustion engines with bigger and bigger batteries is one that we think is is intelligent and we would support. I'm just going to reiterate what you said as well about that Rogan show is with uh, Siddharth Kara. It, like if anyone's listened, hasn't listened to that show, they should. It's uh, that is a massive scandal in what is happening with the mining of cobalt in in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it kind of blew my mind. He's got a book coming out, which I, I'm very interested in reading, but we will put that one up in the show notes. I'm not sure if Danny's listened to it. It's funny you should say that because like I, we know the mining industry well and have consulted in the space and again, come from the commodity sector. This is widely known. Like this is common knowledge in industry that um, 70% of the world's cobalt, which finds its way into basically all of the rechargeable batteries on the planet, comes from some of the most horrendous places on earth uh, as measured by the treatment of labor and child labor and and the conditions under which these people are forced to work. Um, this is widely known. It's interesting to me that it's gone super viral all of a sudden. I guess Joe Rogan can do that. But um, this is one of those same thing like, you know, I, I, with these um, Apple iPhone cities in China, like we call them cities, but they're pretty indistinguishable from, from forced labor camps, if you think about it. I mean, I you know, the, the, the euphemisms that these public affairs teams have used at these big companies, even just the, the word artisanal sounds so sweet and harmless. Um, but artisanal is code for slave labor uh, in the Congo, um, literally hammering away with, with primitive tools to get the cobalt out of the ground that is then processed by China and stuck into every device that is critical to our lives today. Like this, again, this is a choice. Um, uh, we could invest um, to, to develop our own cobalt mines. There's, there's cobalt around the world. It's just not economic. So again, like the fact that we have decided that price matters more than the, the lives of these people is a choice where it's not put in anybody's face, but it's real. And Joe, to the extent that Joe Rogan and his guests, um, begin to put it in people's face, I think that's an important thing. Well, I'm wondering what pressure will now come on the likes of Elon Musk and Tim Cook, um, you would hope a lot of pressure to the point where they actually have to do something about this. Because my assumption is they're going to, the likes of Tesla and, and uh, Apple are going to be some of the biggest buyers of cobalt. Yeah, uh, of all the automakers now. Don't forget, I mean, BYD is a much bigger uh, electric vehicle operator than, than Tesla. Uh, in the last week in China, I think I saw some numbers where Tesla sold 9,000 vehicles and BYD sold 56,000 vehicles. I mean, um, there, there's a whole lot of people that have a lot of explaining to do. Now, it should be said that one of the largest, most heavily invested in research projects in the world is developing lithium ion batteries that don't need cobalt. Um, and, and that's going to be a challenge. Um, there are other battery technologies like that Toyota has been developing um, as well on the horizon. So um, to the extent that this scandal motivates people to develop technologies that move away from cobalt, um, that too will be a good thing. But this is widely known. You know, it's surprising to me that this suddenly becomes, you know, around the clock news and, and so viral because this is, ask anybody, like all the Western mining companies got out of there years ago just to get away from the taint of it, um, left very valuable concessions and resources behind that the Chinese swept, swept in and basically took over. Um, wherever we have outsourced major dirty manufacturing like this to China, um, it like the piece we just wrote on solar, like most, most people don't realize that almost every solar cell in the world is commingled with polysilicon that was made by, you know, forced labor. Um, uh, and, and the U.S. has this crazy policy where we are incentivizing demand and stopping the importation um, um, because the stuff comes from the Ugars. And so it, it's out there, everybody knows it, and then suddenly we start caring about it. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm all for it. It's just an interesting phenomenon as sort of a, as a person in the media, um, you could probably understand like what makes things go viral and what gets people interested is something we're endlessly fascinated by. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd heard previously about these child minds in um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I think I went onto the Tesla website and they had a whole section, maybe on their website or in in one of their prospectuses, but explaining how they ethically source their coal. But obviously, now listening to the show, I know that was complete bullshit. Right, um, but I just. It, It'd just be interesting to see what pressure's put on the likes of Elon Musk, because he's the kind of person that if the pressure does come on it, he will have to do something about it and you know, probably can do something about it. I think Tim Cook as well, though. I mean, he, you know, um, Apple in particular is, is at risk here. Um, and, not, and by the way, it's not just cobalt in the Congo. You know, this same 
polysilicon that goes in to make solar finds its way into all the chips in the world, right? And so the entire economy, many of the key choke points in the entire economy are, are this, is the, this is the natural consequence of NIMBYism. Um, if you do not want to have mines operating home and you outsource them, you also outsource the oversight and the environmental impact that those mines will have. So again, um, we wrote a piece about magnesium. Uh, magnesium is absolutely critical to the auto industry. Um, when Dow shut down its last magnesium plant uh, on the Gulf Coast, China basically took over that entire industry. Um, magnesium is incredibly dirty to make and tough on the environment. Um, and yet in the US or in the UK or in the EU or, or in Australia or in Korea, um, we have environmental controls. You could, it's more expensive, right, to hold companies up to standards and to make sure that they're not polluting local rivers and um, and that they're properly permitted and inspected and, and companies are fined if they break their permits and they release too much pollution. None of that goes on in China. Um, so we're just scarring their environment um, to make ours seem artificially better. Um, this is a, we really have to have a sort of a, a come to Jesus moment, you know, where we talk about the trade-offs here. Um, if you like, we rewrote a piece about uh, a lithium discovery in Maine, a really amazing hard rock lithium discovery in Maine that will never get developed. Um, because Maine has basically outlawed the permitting of new mines in its state. And yet, the same environmental groups that were behind the law and, and cheered its passage, this law that bans permits of new mines, are for the mandate of electric vehicle penetration in Maine. And we made the joke in the piece, you know, like this new mine is 10 miles away as the crow flies from one of the best ski resorts in the Northeast. And I can assure you that if you went into that parking lot, you would see many Teslas. Um, and yet the lithium that's needed, never mind just cobalt, lithium is a very dirty process too, right? Um, the lithium that's needed is right next door, but won't ever be developed. Um, not in our garden, uh, but maybe in yours, you know? And hmm. so this is not only is there not enough of it, the way in which it's being made today um, allows us to sort of turn a blind eye to the environmental damage that's being done. Like, do we care about the planet um, or do we care about the ski hill in Maine? 